Hello, everyone. Welcome to session 50 of Libraries in Recovery. Uh, libraries in US and China across their communities. Uh, session 50, we're, we're surprised at this. Uh, it just started out to be like three to talk about the different circumstance that we all found ourselves in when the pandemic was declared in March of last year. But there kept being more things to talk about and people kept being interested and showing up and they just started rolling forward. It began what you might call as libraries in reaction because we just didn't know really what we were dealing with. Uh, we're still not entirely clear, but we had very little idea then. Uh, then it kind of morphed into libraries in response. People were getting organized and finding out things, handling uh, uh, physical materials, curbside, and uh, different kinds of approaches to actually operating, if not with the building open. That was the question we posed. What is a library if the building is closed? Well, it's actually quite a lot of things. So the main thing that has been is uh, is digital, digital services, uh, internet access outside. We'll talk a lot about that a little bit more uh, today's presentation. And then last fall, it looked like things were getting better and we kind of shifted over to libraries and recovery. So admitting that we're not gonna be back where we were, it's gonna be some kind of a new normal that uh, maybe some kind of a hybrid, just things were gonna be different about how we were gonna operate. And so we're still trying to figure that out and we're still doing that. We had a, a session last week or the week before that you might call libraries in reinvention, uh, where we had a couple of leading architects talk about, you know, space planning and uh, the social environment. So here we are back and it's a kind of celebratory uh, day that we're having. And we have a, a couple of outstanding guests. Uh, we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. Uh, my name is Don Means. I'm the director there. Our uh, host and uh, recording partner is the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, IFLA.org, in uh, the Netherlands. And at the controls there is Stephen Weiber, uh, our longtime uh, Confederate colleague, co-conspirator in uh, advocating for universal public access everywhere. People should be within some kind of easy reach of a public access point, station, library, uh, if possible. Our session sponsor again today is Kelly Dry Warren, the uh, DC law firm that has uh, been helping us with a number of uh, uh, regulatory filings with the FCC related to the new federal programs in the US and, and Spectrum mostly, which has been a, a special area for us. Don, I fear the slides aren't moving forward. Not? Nope. The, the series produced by slide did not show up? It did not show up, I'm sorry. Okay. I'd go, 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 go back to your editing screen then. Um, yeah, go back to the editing slide. And stick, stick with the editing slide, I think that's there. Is that showing? Not yet. No, I stopped sharing, right? Yep, stick with that. All right. Is that uh, a new slide now? Is it May 28th? Stephen? Yes, that's it. Thank you. Uh, so today, sorry for the technical challenges, uh, <laughs> but I, we appreciate the patience. We'll, we'll get this right, maybe by year three. Anyway, today it's a great, uh, kind of a, not really an anniversary, but a, you know, a milestone uh, for these. Uh, we had a lot of replies on the invitation today, you know, see you next Tuesday. So uh, maybe everyone appreciates that this is a, a holiday weekend in the US and people take off not only Monday, but Friday or part of Friday. And so we got a lot of those 
uh, replies today, but I, I still think we're going to have a, a pretty good uh, group and we also record it. And so that'll be for later uh, viewing. Uh, our speakers today are uh, Professor uh, Sophia Xu uh, from uh, China, uh, the uh, uh, Department of Information Management School of Economics and Management, South China Normal University. And uh, we will, she'll be uh, having a, a student, Huang Shi Kui, sorry about that, Kiki, uh, present her, her slides for as she's feeling kind of under the weather, as it turns out today. She's been traveling a lot, and it's also very late in China. It's nearly midnight. So thank you for that. And uh, we also have Lisa Guernsey, Director of Teaching and Learning and Tech Program for New America's Open Technology Institute, going to present this uh, extraordinary study a snap study, she called it, but it, it's revealing. So we're looking forward to that as well. Uh, uh, first, we're going to do the COVID report, which is our kind of our usual uh, early take here. Uh, so since March of last year, it's it's better and worse, uh, but mostly better. Uh, at least in the U.S., it's better. Not everywhere, but in the U.S., it's gotten much better. The vaccinations seem to be very effective at, at slowing the spread. And yet uh, there's a lot of things we don't know about the vaccine, about the vaccines. The variants themselves seem less threatening, but is that for now? They're still mutating. They're talking about boosters on the horizon later this year. There's still a lot to be determined. Uh, sorry for the, the slide. Uh, headings. Uh, so this is current graph here. We've got half the population in the U.S. Is, has uh, at least one dose and 40% are fully vaccinated. And you can see from the curve how different it is today than it was uh, three months ago when it was just seemed out of control. We're back down to looks like kind of mid or late March, kind of early pandemic numbers and uh, speculation and we heard headed toward 70% uh, vaccination rate and that may constitute something like herd immunity. But uh, it's not entirely clear that that will work everywhere because we have a significant population that are not vaccinated and don't plan to be apparently. And so we're now starting to see the, the variance in incidence by 100,000 between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated with the unvaccinated somehow having more uh, incidence in cases of uh, COVID-19. We'll see if people can learn. There many have and many have learned quickly and many seem to uh, take longer. The, the pandemic is not the only crisis as we also talked about <clears throat> last week, or actually yesterday when we had a special session on telehealth, that uh, COVID is not the only crisis that we faced last year. Uh, there were significant uh, weather events. We had, we, we termed it a cascade of crises rolling through the year from, from the Floyd murder to the, uh, to the uh, hurricanes. We had two hurricanes, uh, in uh, at the same time, we had these wildfire wildfires in California, and, and you know we're just entering this season again. Is the point? Uh, enormous it was a hurricane speed winds crossed the, the middle of the country in Iowa and flattened. They lost forty percent of the corn crop in one day, and then we had this just entirely unprecedented phenomenon of two hurricanes uh, arriving more or less at the same time in the Gulf. Uh, just. So, you know, gird your loins, we're, <laughs> the, the, the crises are not over. I think we're gonna be in for another year this year, but we have to be ready for it because people will turn to, uh, to the library in time of uh, stress and, and need. Uh, and it's our position that everybody should live near a sign like this. If there's a, a library or a library access station, uh, maybe a simple kiosk or a pop-up or something should be close to everybody, you know, so you, you could get there if you need it uh, without a lot of trouble. 
this these this is pretty cool. These uh, uh, these pop ups and and uh, uh, portable you know small bookmobile. Why not? We're going to hear a story about uh, how libraries are moving out into the community today. Uh, all kinds of strategies in all kinds of places, but you know whatever works. Uh, even a simple uh, corner in City Hall where a librarian might show up and you know help you with a specific request. Uh, why not new new places that haven't really been served before, like a laundromat, where a lot of people spend a lot of time doing very little? What a great opportunity to engage the library. So now we're get, going to get to uh, the presentations and our presenters. Our first presenter is uh, Sophia Shu. Professor Shu uh, Man is a, a longtime acquaintance uh, of, of mine. We were we've been involved in libraries in China uh, through a commercial venture since the mid '90s, uh, and uh, maybe they'll well they probably won't have time to talk about that. It's a it's a service uh, for libraries where uh, they're provided with uh, authoring and publishing tools for families to come in and bring their material, their their photos, their documents, and so forth, and scan it all, turn it into a kind of a, a book format, a, a digi book is the term they use there, and the library will index that volume and put it in their collection as a permanent uh, part of the library. We call it the, uh, uh, the Library of China with a billion chapters. Anyway, it's a, it's a fascinating uh, story as well, but I don't think we're gonna get to it today. Um, Sophia's not feeling especially well, I mentioned it earlier, and so she's gonna have a student present for her. And then we'll have uh, Lisa Guernsey, who I mentioned earlier, presenting the results of this extraordinary study uh, and we'll be having lots of questions about that. So we're going to have the presentations uh, and have a little Q&A after the first one and then at the end. So uh, thanks very much for your patience on this startup. And uh, so, uh, Sophia, you're still with us. Can you can you say hello? She's got a terrible throat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm here. Yeah. Okay. Well, say hello and introduce uh, Kiki and just kind of tell us whatever you can about what's happening in China and yourself, of course. Uh, hello, everyone. I, my throat is sore and I have a headache. So I invite my graduate student Huang Jiaqi, Titi. Yeah, her English name is Titi. Uh, she will introduce uh, our library uh, services. Uh, um, we will introduce two parts. One is a neighborhood library. And uh, uh, the second is our service in COVID-19. So let my student Huang Jiaqi to deliver speech. Thank you, Sophia. <coughs> we we don't feel I'm sorry. any no no we don't feel any danger from catching your your cold, Sophia. It's one upside from tele <laughs> conversation. Yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> because we are not face to face. <laughs> <laughs> okay, welcome, Kiki. Please go ahead. You're on. Mute, Kiki. Mute button. Oh, no, no. I can't hear you. No, not yet. Are you muted? No. No. Oh, no, no. Is your, your mute button on uh, Zoom? Is it? No, no, she's not. She's not muted on Zoom. I think it's something with the microphone or the computer. Uh, maybe plug your headphones out. Can you take your your headphone jack? 
Hello, everyone. Can you hear ah. me? Yes. yes. That one. Yes. Thank you. Good. Hello. 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 And dear ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, my name is Kiki. Thank you, Mr. Don and Professor Shu invitation. Today, I'm going to tell you about the N Library project and the public uh, library service in China. And then I will show you our PPT, uh, this way a minute about that. Uh, 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 oh, sorry. I can share. You can leave your camera on. You can leave your camera on, but hit the screen share. Okay. I yeah, can share. Uh, because I use the iPad, but I can share my PPT. I can use about that. Could, could, could you send, if you send your PowerPoint to, to me, I'm just going to send you my email address and then you just tell me when I should move on the slide. So I've sent okay. you my email address in the chat. How uh, you send Kitty, it? Kitty, I will, I will send email to Dawn. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. So I just Sophie, talk about- Sophia, can you my... run the slides? Yeah, 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 yeah. Now I Just run the slides. Let Sophia do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, okay. Sorry. Please share, Sophia. Sorry. Uh, just a minute. Just a minute. Okay. Okay. Yes. <coughs> sorry. That's okay. It's okay. We didn't have enough time to rehearse this morning, uh, and it's also very late over there. And we appreciate this. Okay, okay. We know what it's like to stay up so late to talk to you know a lot of strangers, <laughs> and so it's great. We're this is the Dong. first time. Thank this is you, Mr. Dong. Thank you. Dong. Yes. I just said email to you. All right. Yeah. D D Don, can I suggest you send me the slides given that we know our what our our point? Yeah. Not here yet. Okay. But Sophia, if you can simply run the slides yourself, it'll it'll be easier. I, I don't know why I just can't use PC to enter the conference. I just to use my iPad and I can't share uh, the screen. Okay. Yeah. I don't know why today. Okay. So uh, while we're waiting for the slides, why don't you just talk to us about what's been happening uh, with COVID. We can just do verbal. Okay. Many no presenters problem. don't even use them. Okay. I would just talk about our projects. Um, today, I would like to share with you the N Library projects of Foshan Library, also known as the N Library project. N is not only the abbreviations of the neighborhood, but also stand for the combination of numerous libraries. First of all, I will introduce the um, situation of the Neighborhood Library Project initiated by Foshan Library. This project won the first place in the IFLA International Marketing Award in June 2020. That's uh, why was the Neighborhood Library Project that stood out for many participating projects and became the best library marketing project in 2019. It is because of the special nature of the city and in which it is located and the innovation of the project that it has won the if not international marketing award. Foshan is one of the China's manufacturing cities with a population of more than 8.1 million. Many of them come from all over the countries. The city covers an area of 3,875 square kilometers and has more than 300 public libraries. However, due to the uneven distri distribution of this library, many Western find it inconvenient to assess the library resources and services. How to promote neighborhood communication and community integration become a big problem that our public needs to be considered. Therefore, Foshan has launched the Neighborhood Library Project. The project focuses on home reading promotion, 
helping family build personal library by transferring public library resources and services to the home to make reading easier. And the next, the neighborhood library is a family reading promotion project initiated and implemented by Foshan Library in April 2000, uh, 2018. There are two important factors influence the generation of the idea of the neighborhood library project. One is the growth of family reading demand and borrowing. In recent years, more and more families in China have realized the importance of family reading for children's reading. Children's school, family education, and family atmosphere construction and the demand for family reading especially for children's reading, is growing. Second, public library are faced with two limited problems, mainly limited space and human resources. With the increasing connection of both, the space for connection is increasingly tight. At the, at the same time, the number of reader and activity are also increasing and the reading space and activity space of public libraries cannot meet the needs of readers. In, uh, in contrast, the social space and human resources are infinite, so the full development and use of social resources can alleviate the two limited <laughs> dynamics of public library, so the neighborhood library project was born. And the next, the project tests the family as the unit and the public library provides literature resources, provides service support, a seat in building the family reading space and deliver reading services with the neighborhood relationship as the link. The neighborhood library becomes the service point of the library, penetrates into the community extending the library resources and services to the community and family and providing citizens with reading services close at hand. The scale of the portrait has expanded from an initiative 14 libraries in April 2018 to a thousand library by August 2020 with the aim of achieving the goal of reading city for all in order to achieve provide all around services for neighborhood library, Foshan Library has established the library, uh, neighborhood library management committee according to the business process of the implementation of the neighborhood library project. It is divided into eight working group, including the overall planning group, publicity group, recruitment group, circulation group, resource guarantee group, management group, activity group, and the te technical group, so as to realize the whole process, closed loop management. Moreover, Foshan Library also guarantees the corresponding right and obligation of neighborhood library through relevant regulations. Next page. During COVID-19 control period in early 2020, the end library management committee gives full pay to its, in, to its management and service function, organize the activity plan, 21 days reading and clocking from February 7th to March 7th. For neighborhood library cooperated with libraries in five districts of Washington to encourage family in neighborhood library to take advantage of stay at home time, read every day for 21 days, develop a good reading habit and need more friends to join the rank of reading. The activity was actively participated by 138 and library, making reading a new fashion at home. At the same time, neighborhood library curators innovate service methods, relying on modern network technology and live focus platform from curator to anchors and active, actively carry out online live focus reading activities. By establishing a multi-level linkage mechanism, the resource of each library 
can be integrated to enhance the influence of the neighborhood library project in the region. The multi-level linkage mechanism has Boshan Library as the main center and five district level library as the subcenter to pray for it to pray for the advantage of the main branch library system. By the making use of the interlibrary linkage, more social family families will be invited to join the neighborhood library project so as to realize the equalized development of neighborhood library services. The IFLA International Marketing is a very important award in world librarianship. In the past, Chinese public library did poorly in IFLA International Marketing Award. It was a breakthrough that for some libraries and library project can won the award in 2020. Similar to Little Free Library, N Library Project has the characteristic of leading the main branch of public library, supporting modern information technology and paying more attention to use of civilian human resources. In fact, since the establishment of the International Marketing Award by the IFLA Management and Marketing Committee in two, 2002. China has won two first prize, two second prize, and one first prize, and four of winners were university library. Uh, library. Compared compare with the award-winning marketing project of domestic college and university, the marketing project of public library are no less impressive. In the past 10 years, Chinese public library has made continuous innovation in the field of library marketing with the help of the country's efforts to develop public cultural services and promote the nationwide reading. They have missed some achievement in the lower tier of marketing activity. The richness of marketing activity types and the social influence of marketing activities. And then the Neighborhood Library Project won the first prize of the International Marketing Award for the first time for a public library in China. And it is also the first time for a public service project of a public library in China to win the award. It has a milestone significant for the impact on the management and marketing of public library in China. By the end of the July 2021, the number of neighborhood library has gone to 1,203 and the number library and the member library have spontaneous organized 1,064 various reading promotion areas, serving 32,000 readers, borrowing more than 251,000 books from the library and lending 94,000 books to the neighbor, leading the national trend of the reading. And the uh, next part, I will talk about the uh, um, public library services during COVID-19. Mm. And then I will uh, provide it by three representative public library, including Shenzhen Library, Guangzhou Library, and Shanghai Library. In the context of the COVID-19 epidemic, readers have changed their re reading and the surface mode of public library has also changed. During the period of epidemic prevention and control, oh, oh my god, <laughs> they can show it the PVD. <laughs> um, public library, knowledge and information service institution to carry out social education and serve the decision making of the internet should give full play to the professional will of the um, readers of uh, service and help the epidemic prevention and control, which should arouse the extensive thinking of the library com community. At the same time, due to the outbreak of the epidemic, many continuous services of public library in our country have been interrupted. The service network has undergone profound trends and reader service are facing huge challenge. However, Shenzhen Library has managed to meet the difficulty head on by establish, 
epidemic social resources extending the long period, integrating digital literature resources and strengthening online reading promotion. Shenzhen Library has effectively protected readers' reading rights and interest. interest. Guangzhou Library adopted the strategy of home service of Liberia, kept up with the epidemic dynamic of COVID-19, established a special web page for the epidemic as soon as possible, connect information related to COVID-19, popularize public science for lo novel coronavirus, and connect anti-epidemic social memory service. Some original offline activities were moved to to the online platform through technical means to help strengthen the online service mode and ac actively respond to the social co cooperation of the library community. During the post period, Shanghai Library has been providing online reading promotion service through WeChat official account, Weibo, Shanghai Library apps and website after the opening, Shanghai Library entered the stage of normalized epidemic prevention and control services, provide readers with public cultural services, special epidemic topic, digital resources, reading promotion. And last, I will I would like to introduce to you the investigation of COVID-19 emergency service in Chinese library. As a public cultural institution, how to deal with the emergency challenge brought by the COVID-19 has become a, show with a serious problem for Chinese library. According to relevant research finding, the emergency service provided by domestic library meaning include, include first one, digital resources services. Public library provide with which digital resources. There are three ways to accept digital resources. Firstly, without logging in, you can directly click the link or scan the QR code. And then secondly, it is necessary to bind the reader's card and user with, without certificate can apply for virtual e-reading card in real name. Thirdly, reader can use the account and password provided. As the February 2020, more than 100 library and related institution in China have raised a large number of the material, including more than 15,000 mark and nearly 357,000 pairs of graphs, 13 tons of season vegetable and so on for charitable support. And then the last one, online activity, Capital Library of China, Nanjing Library and Xinjiang Library have launched anti-COVID lighting knowledge competition. And the first and the fourth reading therapy service, many libraries provide reading therapy service by recommending books fields or open classes. For example, Nation Library of China, Nanzhou University Library, and Fujian Library recommended bi uh, bibliography and comic, etc., to help us overcome anxiety. And the next one, publicity of anti-COVID-19 related knowledge. Library publisher uh, published the knowledge of anti-COVID-19 by recommending relevant book, open classes and the correct use of masks. Other useful propaganda means include uh, broadcasting anti-COVID-19 cartoons, releasing and reprinting anti-COVID-19 news, etc. Sichuan Library helped to uh, popular, uh, popularize COVID-19 prevention and control measures in ethnic minority areas. And the sixth part, um, identification of COVID-19 rumor. Shanghai Library published the 
article how to obtain true and reliable information during the anti-COVID-19 period. Yunnan Library launched the COVID-19 rumor crusher module on WeChat. Wuhan University Library recommended book and special information literature module to improve the information literature uh, literacy to readers so as to help the user improve their ability to identify the true and false information. Um, sorry about that. That's all, uh, that's all I want to share with you today due to the time constraint. And I'm very sorry that I cannot show you more relevant service of public library. And I hope I will have the opportunity opportunity to share and community with you in the future. And the above in my content information, everyone can continue to communicate with me after the meeting through the above content information. I also hope to hear more peer voice and together with you to promote the development of our library services. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Kiki. That was just great. I, sorry, the slides were a little bit. Thank you, uh, Mr. Tong. We got we got the slides. It was a team effort, but I think we got them and and really got a, a picture of an, just an amazing story, and it and it kind of brings back the uh, the notion, uh, you know, that this is a global environment. This pandemic has created a new global opportunity as well as a crisis. And we think no one is better suited to collaborate around the world than the world's libraries. And I think you've just made that point uh, with your different innovations, which are happening everywhere. And so the opportunity to, to share those activities, those innovations uh, is a great thing. And it's also special to have you and Sophia from China on. It's the first time we have China up here. And, and uh, of course, the, the relationship with China and the US is really important. It's kind of struggling a little bit these days, but maybe this is the beginning of uh, library diplomacy. So we can, uh, we can share and not, uh, not worry about uh, politics, but uh, the things that libraries all have in common, the idea of access to, to information and to the exploration of ideas. And, and so it's just great. Sophia, you have, Anything to add right now? We'll see if there's some questions. I'm sorry, I just uh, use my PC to end the conference. So maybe we share our PPT very late. Mm -hmm. Sure. Can you hear me? Can yes. you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and please uh, enter any uh, email contacts into the chat if you'd like. Uh, somebody to be able to contact you directly, put your email in okay, the chat. Okay, okay, yeah. Because um, I, th I think there may be a lot of questions that people are having right now. Um, do you have goals for this year, for 2021? 2021? Yeah, yes. This project has goals uh, in 2021 and everyone uh, can let, uh, Way, uh, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> I can't talk to in English. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did a great job of, of uh, reading the script. I, I appreciate that. Uh, I know what it's like. Actually, I, I don't even attempt a second language, so I don't really know what it's like, but we try to listen more carefully to people who do the courtesy to speak in in English, and, and so thank you. Uh, will the will the neighborhood library project expand to other libraries? Are they already ready to embrace Sophia? Pardon? Are other libraries in China uh, adopting the N Library program? More libraries. In, in COVID. Do you ask you, me, sorry? You know more, in you know more libraries. I can't hear you very clearly. I don't know why. Okay. I can't hear you. 
Yeah. All right. Well, I'll I'll type it into the chat. <laughs> I don't know um, why. Let's see. What? Else. Uh, can you say more about reading therapy services? What what is that? How does it work? How do reading therapy services work? What's the uh, what's the can, method? Yes. Let me see. Um, I would like to know more about the reading therapy service offered by the library. They can show more uh, both about the health and the wellness uh, in the library. And according to the disposed, they can um let them um very uh, relax and uh, and <laughs> and happiness in the future just they can put the um post about the health or the um this next year or the other um, topics of the book of uh, health in the um, library, which is very shiny space. So uh, that yeah, are are all <laughs> are all libraries in China now open? Um, yes, they open. They are open. Normal, they are open regular, and, but. Uh, during in the COVID nineteen, they are very um, care about the prevention and the controls, so that uh, they can make uh, lots of measures to um, to let the uh, readers come in the libraries. Yachi, <laughs> Yachi, um, mm, mm. 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 这里有人说艾米艾米丽艾米丽安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全安全
we um, produced at New America. And for those of you who may not know, what, what is New America? We are a, a think tank, a research institute. We have offices in many different places, but our main office is in Washington, DC. And so I'm coming to you right now from just outside Washington, DC. I live in Alexandria, Virginia, and I run a program called Teaching, Learning, and Tech. It's part of our education policy work. We look at all sorts of different dimensions of how technology intersects with learning and public libraries and school libraries are a big part of what we are investigating from the point of view of the ecosystem of learning that um, we should be evolving in our communities. So what we did in this, um, in this project was to ask some questions given the uh, incredible disruption of the pandemic. And just to cast your minds back to say the summer of last year, you know, when we were planning this study, public library buildings were closed. Um, students were trying to take classes remotely. I mean, we remember, and all of this is still maybe very, very resonant with us even today, right? But so many of us were just trying to run our lives entirely online. And what we wanted to understand at New America was if we're trying to do everything at home, online, does that mean that people are finding their libraries? Are they finding their libraries in a digital form? Are they gonna be able to use the digital resources that their libraries offer? And then the other big question for us certainly was whether or not the um, internet access that they might have relied upon because they had used internet at the physical location of the library, now they didn't have access to that. So who, who lost their main access to internet when these buildings closed? So those were some of the kind of the key guiding questions um, here. And so what I wanna do is just take you through um, a couple of the, just the contextual pieces and some of the data points that, um, that came out of this survey. Um, and, I, and I should also note, and I've put up here, um, in front of you that obviously we're not the only ones to study this. And many of you probably know about John Horrigan's research both at Pew and now he's a, it also um, working in many other areas. Um, but over the years, he's been doing surveys in the United States of how people use their public libraries. And it's showed how the majority of Americans really believe in the work of libraries to help people build digital skills, but also that they're really using libraries as like a key point a key access point. One of the other pieces of context for us at New America was um, broadband access and affordability. So Don mentioned the upper, uh, the very, very beginning when he was introducing me that a, a group at New America called the Open Technology Institute. Um, and I do work with them as well as with the education group. And we, really, we focus very um, intently on equity in internet access. How can we ensure that people who um, are lower income have the ability to get the same quality and reliability of internet access that those who are in higher income households can get? So here's just some data points about just the cost in the United States of internet. Um, and uh, it's not at all hard to understand that when home-based internet might cost more than $68 per month, then um, as Pew has found and other surveys have found, but in this case, 51% of households um, that are under say $25,000 a year, they're not gonna be able to afford home internet access. So given all of that, we put together this, um, this survey that I'm gonna talk to you about. What we did, our methodology included um, a nationally representative survey of the general public. We did it using SurveyMonkey. So this is a big caveat to put up right at the beginning. This was a survey that was done online. Um, it was not a telephone survey. We would have loved to do a telephone survey, but they're much, much more expensive. Um, and a side note, we do have a telephone survey coming um, in the next month on some of these similar issues. So that'll give us even more depth. But we did an online survey from September 25th to October 13th of last year. And um, from that, we had more than uh, 2,600 people responding. And we had asked, we asked them questions about how they were using their public library and what kind of internet access they had. And then also whether they were using the digital resources that were offered in their public library. We also did interviews with library leaders across the country just to understand what kind of innovations were emerging from public libraries as they were coping with the closures and making sure that they were accessible to the public in new ways. 
So here's just um, some of the, the data points I just mentioned in terms of the end size for our survey. One of the things that we knew from the survey data right off the bat is that our number, the percentage of people responding to the survey who said they had high speed internet at home was 88%. That is higher than what we've seen in some other surveys. And we know that it's very likely that's because this was an online survey. So again, the caveat is I think these are undercounts. Like a lot of our numbers about the, the difficulty that people had to gain access to the library, um, it's already gonna be pretty stark and I'll show you that in the data here in a moment. But we think this is actually probably underestimating the problem because we were of course getting our, our data online in the first place. However, even given that, 15% of the people we surveyed said that they lost their main source of internet access when the libraries closed due to the pandemic. So let me take you to um, some of our key findings really quickly here, and then I'll take you to a couple of charts and graphs, and then um, I'm excited to open it up to discussion. So um, just the four kind of key findings listed here are that we found that there was mixed awareness of the public library's online resources. Um, some people were like, yeah, sure, I know how to get an ebook and I can figure it out. And others were like, what? Ebooks, libraries, TV books? Didn't know it. Um, we also saw a shift towards online resources, which of course is not at all surprising <laughs> given that that was really their only option in many cases. We found in the survey results, mostly positive attitudes towards public libraries and their online resources. I mean, public libraries are such incredible institutions and have such trust from the public. And that came through very strongly in our, in our survey data. And then lastly, we found many disparities. And this is where the equity issues really started to, to come forth. We found many disparities in access to uh, public libraries resources and in the way that they were used. So we'll get to that in a moment. Here's um, just um, quickly the data on the positive impression that people have of their public library. And you see here that 76% um, um, said they had a, had a positive impression and um, only 2% were, were negative. Here's some of the data that I'm gonna show you about the evidence of the digital shift that was brought on by the pandemic. Let's see if I show this here. Yes, so we, we found that um, the way we asked the survey question was we asked people to recall what life was like for them before the pandemic, before March, um, the middle of March 2020, and how did they use the library, and how did, did they use the library's websites in, the, in their apps, and then we asked them, so now, now that it's October of 2020, how are you using the library, and the shift was that 28% said that they used the public um, library's uh, website or app before the pandemic, and it jumped up to 39%, 39% of them said that they were using it um, now. We found um, some um, expected and some unexpected relationships between the use of online resources and particular demographic categories, such as income and race. And so I wanna go through some of those with you right here. Um, so starting with the first, our results showed a positive relationship um, between income and the use of a library's online resources. And as you can see in the chart here, I'm sorry, this probably is a little small for you to see, and all of this is in the report, but um, the higher the income that respondents reported, the more likely they were also to report that they use the website or app. Um, and this was the case for both before the pandemic and during the pandemic. Um, and though it's not depicted in this chart, we also found that the higher the income that was reported, the more likely people were just able to respond, said yes when they were asked if your library offered online resources. So in, in other words, those who were in higher income categories or were more well off were more aware of the library's resources and, and um, more likely to report using them. But uh, Lisa, yes. could you go back to that? Yes, yes, it, sure. It, uh, it looks like that the uh, lower income people had the greatest percent increase. So yes. 33 is like 50% increase over 22% and 46 over 34 is, you know, what, 25% uh, something. So that's interesting, the differential percentages that's a really good point, Don. And um, yeah, we it, and, and all this data is open and available for additional analysis, just like that. I mean, the um, 
necessity <laughs> that people were kind of faced with in terms of getting online and finding ways to get online. I think that that's um, perhaps at play here too, but that's a really interesting um, key kind of point there. Well, I've got you on this. Uh, let me ask if you've, if you've extrapolated, you talked about your, you know, this is undercount, you suspect, because it's an online survey. Have you just sort of, you know, imagined how much of an undercount it might be on these various things? For yeah, I don't have it right in front of me, but we did go back um, to do a comparison to the Pew surveys from a couple of years ago that did use other methods and had a lot more resources and we're doing kind of things in more longitudinal sort of way. Um, and I and I don't have it right in front of me in terms of what the difference was in terms of like, so if ours showed that 88% of respondents had home internet access, um, it was significantly lower in the Pew study. I can I can go back and get that perhaps for us, but you could maybe extrapolate from a, that percentage difference. Um, but there's probably a lot more that would need to be accounted for. And in this, upcoming um, survey that I mentioned. It's not just about libraries. Um, it's about online virtual learning. Um, we found that not only we were getting some good, and this was from a telephone survey, we we're getting some really good data back about still how many people, especially in the po at the poverty line and below, were having a hard time getting online affording internet. But we were finding that many people are saying that they, even if they're at the poverty level, were getting online, but then they were getting online because they had a mobile phone. They weren't, they weren't necessarily getting home broadband access in the way we would. So they were able to do online school, but through a phone with data caps or with their phone service cut off if they didn't pay their bill, things like that. And so what we, in this new survey upcoming, that I'll I'm happy to send you guys a link to the event about it. We use the term underconnected. That, mm -hmm. But we're finding that more and more that families, especially lower income families, are underconnected. They they might answer yes that they have internet access, but in fact, it's still very difficult for them to, to get online. Yeah. We've we've used the term meaningfully connected. Mm -hmm. So you know it's also somewhat yeah. debatable. One yeah. thing that was not in the Pew study uh, uh, was the number of people that entirely rely on libraries for internet access. They had a, they had, their result was something like 77 million people, phenomenal number, uh, 14 and over used the access, the internet at a library. Uh, but they didn't really separate how many people solely rely. So it was some combination we still don't know. Right, right. Uh, whether people went there, you know, for the other reasons, it was faster, quiet. Uh, didn't affect their data caps, all the different reasons that people might go to the library, even if they had some kind of access at home. I hope they include that uh, this coming time because I suspect it's a substantial number. Yes, and our question didn't ask about sole access either, but we use the word main, main source of internet yeah. access. Um, but even then you're still not quite getting at all those different nuances you're describing there. Um, all right, so I'll jump to this. I um, wanted to quickly describe some of the data on age um, because some of this was actually a little surprising to us. Um, uh, and again, I hope this isn't too hard for people to read, but this, this table shows we had respondents who were between 30 and 44 years of age were the most likely to report using the library's website or app since the start of the pandemic. And then the younger ones, 18 to 29, were a close second. Um, and those 60 and older were the, the least likely to have reported. But at the same time, the data show that the older the respondent, the more likely they were to report having a positive overall view of the public library and less likely they were to report having difficulties in navigating the library's website. Um, and there's more in the report that we can dig into there too, but it, it could be that there's some self-selection going on here and that the older, the ones 60 and older who are in fact, digitally um, uh, have some digital literacy and use the website are, are um, more adept to kind of find what they need on it. Um, let me go to the next slide here so we can jump to some, there's important data on um, differences by race and ethnicity that I wanted to get to here. Um, so we found that there were some real um, correlations. So, um, 
just as we in this earlier slides were looking at kind of income level and the, and the correspondence with economic privilege, findings um, here show that there are some racial disparities in those who experience issues navigating the library's websites and apps, finding resources that they need, um, finding or having the physical tools to access these things at all. Um, so the way we laid this out here was uh, you can see the columns um, for race and ethnicity, black, Asian, Hispanic, and white. Um, but we also, just the way we set this up in terms of the questions, basically what, what we found is that white respondents were the ones that were less likely to say that they needed help navigating and that the, the um, African-American respondents were the least likely to say they had no issues. Um, and they also were the ones that were the most likely to report internet connectivity issues when attempting to access online resources. And now, um, last but not least, there are some findings in the report that we wanted to kind of bring forward to you about this point about losing your main source of internet. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you some of these data points here too, and then we can get a couple of recommendations um, some stories about community connection, and then we'll open it up to some questions. Um, so our survey results showed that there were definitely demographic, demographic differences between those who lost their main source of internet and those who did not. So as you see here, those who reported relying on the library for their primary source of internet were more likely to be male, which is interesting. They were more likely to live in an urban area, to speak a language other than English at home, and to be Hispanic black or, um, or black. For example, 39% of our respondents who reported losing their main source of internet with library closures also reported speaking a language other than English at home compared to 18% who um, did not rely on the library for their main source of internet. And there were some differences in usage as well. Um, let's see, I'll just look closely here. Yes. So. This, and we think this is kind of a critical point for equity, but those who um, were needed, really needed the library to meet critical needs, such as accessing information related to employment, education, or healthcare, um, were those who were also having the harder time getting to the resources. Um, so for example, you see that 35% of people who lost internet when the library shut down relied on that internet for work or professional development compared to only 21% of those who had lost, um, who, who could access the internet at home or elsewhere. Now, just um, quickly, that there's some really, really neat stories in this report. And I had many colleagues working on me with this. We did interviews with library leaders across the country. And we had four stories that we highlight in the report um, of different ways that libraries were changing and pivoting to meet the needs. Um, the, the picture that we saw earlier, Don, that you, you put up at the beginning of the mobile you know, mobile library van with the books. Um, we have a story of that in um, in Florida where the van also became a Wi-Fi, mobile Wi-Fi kind of hotspot and they put Wi-Fi emitters on the van and then would park in parks um, so that kids could come with their families and do homework around the van and get um, help with internet um, issues as well while they were there. There were a lot of new virtual programs and new tools that are being offered. Um, just this outdoor pop-up library concept has become a um, big one. I'm really excited to hear from anyone else on the, on the call here about what you might be doing. And then this concept of digital navigators, which maybe you've already talked about as a group, but this was really compelling to us. And Salt Lake City uh, Library, they've been piloting, piloting this program with CARES dollars and in conjunction with the National um, Digital Inclusion Alliance to, to build more kind of digital navigating mentorship into their digital equity programs. So quickly, I'm just going to go through some of the, um, there's a lot to, to read here, but we did have policies, uh, policy recommendations in the report, um, and we really are pushing for um, investment in the efforts that libraries are making, especially um, libraries and schools together to bring in and access to um, families and to students. Um, continued to push on lowering the cost of broadband and to really start encouraging and, and finding ways to use federal dollars or state dollars to encourage community organizations, libraries and schools to work together more. Um, 
there's it needs to be more funding on these di digital um, navigator types of programs and support for um, assessments on kind of what's what's really working. So I'll just kind of call out here that this this recommendation around really encouraging this kind of collaboration, I think is a, is a key one. And you guys are right at the forefront of a lot of that. Um, we had recommendations in here about what libraries could do to raise awareness of their of their resources in the first place and to um, be more targeted in their outreach so that those who are lower income or in communities of color see the library resources and also that those library resources are welcoming to them or re relevant to them as well. Um, and then lastly, we had some recommendations for community organizations and schools that they need to be putting libraries into their strategic plans, recognizing the libraries as um, partners on all of this work. So um, Chris, many of the folks who were involved in our project, I'll, I can share all of this with you later, and there's some ways to follow us um, in the future. And I will stop sharing my screen and looking forward to questions. Wow, Lisa, what an effort to, uh, to pull all that uh, together so quickly. Uh, the, the point you and I talked about it earlier about the school library partnerships and uh, how rare they actually are and how, you know, at the surface level, how obvious they seem like they should be, yeah. but yet are not. Yeah. And, you know, of course, we've talked about this in different governance, different funding streams, libraries are local, schools are mostly controlled by the state. And somehow they just don't really match up, even though school libraries and public libraries share, you know, students, uh, at least preschoolers, after schoolers, homeschoolers, yeah, you know, it's, yeah. it's just, and, but I, your, your point about community organizations facilit facilitating those kinds of relationships, do you, how do they do that? I mean, the schools and libraries themselves can't seem to do it. How can a third party kind of step in and broker such a thing? Yeah, you know, it's an interesting question, Don. And I think it's a it's gonna be different in each locality, but mm. it's a it's about capacity building for that kind of um, collaborative effort. So if there is a community-based organization in a in a community, say it's even maybe a community foundation that um, sets up a, whether it's small grant programs or forums or summer institutes, but some mechanism to bring library leaders and school leaders together to really kind of strategically plan and share, um, then you can I think make a lot more headway because right now the library leaders are already overburdened and tasked right. with so many things and the schools the superintendents are like especially now right and um Don't age of covid them. a million <laughs> things to do and so there needs to be some capacity building this means investment um in financial resources right paying someone to take that on as their job um but also using the infrastructure that might already exist. Maybe there's an early learning council in a community that has library leaders and schools already on it. Yeah, no, that's good. Uh, uh, and, uh, a funding, a new funding source that would help such collaborations is a really good idea. And it's probably easier to do it in smaller communities than larger ones because the systems can be so, so massive and, and difficult to do. What we have uh, seen and actually promoted are collaborations around connectivity and infrastructure. So here now you have the, the, the system, the, the network administrators who actually can have meaningful conversations across these cultures. Uh, probably the only other job category besides librarians can actually have meaningful conversations. You get a, a chancellor and a, a superintendent together and they just have different languages and terms and risk and everything. Maybe they can talk about basketball, but probably not actual collaboration around education. Although I'd a, say, I'm yeah. just kind of, you're making me think in the, in the presentation prior that focused on things like the, um, you know, literacy, reading therapy. I mean, I do think early literacy is a place where there can be some, um, right. there already right. is a lot of collaboration where you have, teachers that are working with public librarians to make sure that sets of books are available in the public library that match, you know, the reading level of their students, things like that. Really good point. And, and also probably the reason that the millennial generation is the number one user of libraries is because they have uh, preschoolers and, and uh, young uh, children at home. 
The other point you made, uh, which really strikes me and is the potential for the libraries to do these kinds of things because of one of their main assets, and that's the trust of the community and the individuals in it. And the, currently in the circumstance we have now where public institutions are just uh, you know, falling in the level of public trust, uh, government in general. And so the libraries are kind of not doing anything different, but they're floating up in comparison to these. And so that's a, that's a, key, a key asset that they have uh, not to exploit, but to remind people. Uh, and, and they don't have to really remind people, people just know it, but they'll listen. Getting the word out has been the library's biggest problem. People don't know. I didn't know they did that. I mean, it's just that we hear it over and over and over again. So uh, we're looking to do more in that whole area of advocacy. Librarians are typically not that great at, at pushing themselves and promoting themselves, you know. They're, but we'll maybe we're going to do an assertiveness training. Yeah, for and you've reminded today. me, Don, of something I should have mentioned earlier. In addition to the interviews with library leaders and in, in the national survey, we also did. Um, it was it's more like a kind of a convenient sample, so it's not methodologically sound. But we did a survey of about a hundred teachers and like after school leaders, and and how they thought of their public library. And and the reason we and, and so we got some good data on that and that's in the report as well. But the reason we did that was because we think that this outreach problem that public libraries have mm -hmm. is something that should not just be on the shoulder of the public libraries or even of you know, other kinds of library institutions that the entire kind of ecosystem of learning needs to recognize that libraries are that kind of an anchor. And so those who are running after school programs, the teachers, um, in public schools, the leaders of public schools need to kind of help and get the word out, but they too may not know. So, you know, so there's a little bit of a strategic um, communications here would be to get those educators to really understand what the libraries offer so they can then be the conduit to tell more and more of their constituents. Well. That's, you've made a great case for why New America is uh, picking up part of that role. And we'd like to think that's kind of our mission almost to, to help uh, bring that awareness from, the, from not inside the profession, but a great admirer of this profession and these, and these precious institutions. Um, uh, the, yeah, I think we've touched on most of these uh, questions. I don't see anything in the chat uh, anybody uh, want to have a last chance at a question for Lisa? Uh, and Lisa, you you did summarize the, the recommendations, and usually we close by asking our guests to make a call to action. So I guess you've already done that. But what would be your top, you know, ask for, for people to do, you know, the people on the call who are mostly librarians, but not only? Yeah, well, I'm thinking about right now, given that CARES Act for in the, in the United States, we have CARES Act dollars that are coming down to communities. We have money through um, what's called ESSER in the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, some new funding that's come through um, the American Rescue Plan and other stimulus. And what I, what I worry about is that we're missing a key opportunity, like right mm. Right now and in June and in July, communities will be getting themselves together and trying to figure out what they can do with this new infusion of funds um, that of course meets the guidelines for rescue and recovery. But if, if we don't have library leaders at the table at those conversations, um, then we could miss like a key opportunity to do more of the digital navigator work to like recognize the anchor institution role that libraries play, the, the way that broadband access needs to be rolled out. So I guess when, and maybe many of you are already doing this um, and probably are, so um, forgive me, but just inserting yourself as much as possible into those, um, those local conversations about how to use some of the new dollars. I think that would be really key. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And we have, we had uh, the IMLS director drop in on us yesterday to uh, mention, you know, all these new funds, not just coming through IMLS, but as you mentioned, all sorts of uh, uh, streams of, you know, 
it's almost like an overreaction, right? And it's classic emergency response. You know, we don't really want to spend any money because, you know, it doesn't happen here. And then it happens and the blank checks come out and then, and then fades quickly. And we go, oh, well, that's yesterday, you know? So it's a moment, you're right, right now to not only respond to the current crisis, it's still a crisis, though we should have done a lot of this like a year ago, but nevertheless, uh, but also to, to think longer term, what can we do that's both responsive now and will pay benefits over the years ahead because this is not, this current moment of, of funding is not gonna last. We may see you know, a, a retraction pretty soon, but great point. Um, so we're gonna close with that, but I'd like everybody to unmute if you would, everybody unmute, because if we were together, you know, in a conference room somewhere, we would be thanking our speakers for making the time and giving us the great information. So we'd give you a round of applause. So that's what we're gonna do right now, everybody, please. Thank, thank Lisa and Sophia and Kiki. Yeah, that's great, really, thank you so much. Well, thank you. The uh, recording will be up by Monday and it'll be on the pandemic response page at giglibraries.net per the first slide. And we already have 49 of them up there. And so this is number 50, which is great. So thanks again, Lisa. Thank you, Sophia. You had to get off and, and thank you, Kiki. And we'll, we'll have you back because we want to do a follow-up. We need more data. I can help you with whatever you need. I'll be there in a minute. Okay, good. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, okay. Mr. Don. Thank you. <laughs>